Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Aparuta de sangamatasa tawara So we're all gathered here this afternoon. As many members of the Sangha, the Sangha has is uh, living human beings. So we count how many how many people are here, and we can say uh, we see them always as individuals. Monks or nuns or anagarikas, anagarikas, lay people. We have different names we give to these various forms. When we take refuge in Sangha, what does that really mean practically? You know, in terms of a real refuge, you take refuge in bhikkhus or in in a collection of people or Theravada Buddhist Sangha is a you know it's a, Sangha is a word generally used for a group of people many people together So I remember in the early years there were arguments about what Sangha really meant. There was a kind of hard line that said it just means bhikkhu Sangha. And uh, others, you know, is uh, our lay people, uh, lay teachers uh, say they're in a Sangha. Is that the real Sangha? And then we form opinions about what is traditional, what is right, what is, uh, you know, our particular interpretation of the word. But when we take refuge in Sangha, Sangkang Sarnangachami, are we taking refuge in the forms of uh, tradition or a particular group of monks or group of nuns? Is it just, a, uh, you know, is it, is that what we mean? Or is Sangha a much more profound term for one who practices, supatipano, one who practices well. And this uh, is up to all of us, you know, whatever our position is in the, in the tradition. So the encouragement is to, you know, we have symbols, we have with Buddha Rupas, we don't, do we take refuge in Buddha Rupas or Dhamma in Thailand, for example, in Wat Pa Pong, I remember, uh, they have, uh, they had a uh, very nice ornate bookcase in the sala with a collection of the Tripitaka, and that's the Dhamma. Then the bhikkhus sitting on the 
platform or the Sangha. These are external symbols only. And what is, what is the value of symbols? What, you know, how do we relate to the symbols we find ourselves inheriting in this tradition? So symbols are like Buddha Rupas or icons or statues, golden images. They, they can be very beautiful or very ugly. You know, they aren't always beautiful to look at. They can be. But whatever they, they look like, whether they're big or small, whatever mudra they re represent, they're a symbol for awakened, awakeness here and now, mindfulness here and now. So that, that's what we take refuge in. So it's not like idol worship or, or you know, believing there's some magic powers in the Buddha Rupas here. That's superstition. We project, we can project all kinds of powerful uh, images onto the, the Buddha Rupa here, the Prapatan in the, the temple. Some Buddha Rupas, you know, what they can do is they inspire. Some are very inspiring, others, uh, you know, I was in a, uh, visiting uh, in India, in Assam years ago on a tea plantation, and then they, they uh, took me to a Buddhist community in northeastern in India, in Assam, where there was a, a Samanera, you know, a little kind of grubby temple near the railroad track in this small town. <clears throat> And the Buddha Rupa was really ugly, you know, it was made out of cement and, and uh, it wasn't at all inspiring. And so, so, you know, is that, do you ex expect to be inspired by them? If one is an aesthete, you know, where you're dependent upon perfect beauty, then we, we get intimidated by symbols. We form opinions and views about whether they're good, bad, beautiful, or ugly. But even an ugly Buddha Rupa is still a symbol for awakened awareness. And that's what I, the emphasis is on in this reflection. Awakened awareness, not on having perfectly good taste in, in interior decoration or temple adornments and whatnot, because we can get carried away with, with our own views about what's beautiful and what isn't. But awakened awareness, we're aware of that. If we very very high standards of aesthetic beauty where, you know, anything that doesn't quite live up to our high standard of beauty is rejected or we, we feel averse or contempt for, then we're, if we follow those emotions, we're caught in the, in the cycle of samsara. You know, so we have to live a, in a life, you know, just trying to, to bend the situations we're in so it meets our high standards of good taste. And that's not liberation, that's not enlightenment. That's just suffering. Or we can go the opposite direction, say symbols don't really matter at all, you don't need Buddha Rupas. All that, you know, we're above all that. That's still a kind of supercilious snobbery, you know, thinking we know what the Buddha really taught in our view, our opinion about Buddha Dhamma is the right one, and if you don't agree with me, you're all wrong. But if, if you tend to that extreme, you know, you can be aware of it, aware of, of this very 
kind of superior attitude or your, your own sense of what's right that you grasp and hold to and then judge everything else, everyone else by that standard. So I received a question about enlightenment. What is enlightenment? And it's a common enough word in, in this tradition. We talk about enlightenment. What is it? What do we mean by that? So this is an investigation of the word, you know, so that we're, we're not just defining it according to the Pali English Thai dictionaries. We, we have, you know, we get e easily definitions from outer sources. Various people, individuals have various views about enlightenment. In Thailand, some monks, I remember Ajahn Chah talking to some Thai monks from the town who said, told him that there are no, nobody can get enlightened these days because uh, uh, it's not like the time of the Buddha where there were, you know, people becoming enlightened just in, in the, the thousands. But nowadays, uh, it's impossible. That's a viewpoint, isn't it, about whether anyone can get enlightened. <clears throat> and questions about, was Ajahn Chah enlightened? What do we mean by that when we talk about, when we wonder about Ajahn Chah being enlightened? Is it, do we expect him to be something extraordinary? And so, you know, then, uh, but actually, just taking the word itself, light is a symbol, isn't it? It's a reality, like, it's enlightenment means seeing clearly, if you're seeing in the light, seeing the way things are for yourself, not just believing what you've been told or what everyone else believes. Sometimes the proper monks shouldn't even discuss enlightenment because it's a, a dodgy subject, you know. But what I'm trying to do now is just to investigate the word, reflect on it for each one of you, just to challenge yourself to, to observe how you see that word right now. Your own definition your own assumptions about it. Whatever they might be, whether you believe it's possible, uh, whether you think you're enlightened, or I'm enlightened, or Ajahn Chah is enlightened, or we're not enlightened. These are all thoughts that we create. We, we, we grasp thinking. We grasp words, we grasp definitions, we grasp symbols. We grasp our sense of righteousness. There's really nothing more difficult than a righteous monk or nun because they always have to be right, no matter what. But is right a kind of permanent state of being? Is one, you know, is any human being, living individual, always right? Can we be 100% right as a person, as a senior monk or senior nun? Can we, is that something that is expected or projected onto members of the Sangha?
So the enlightenment, then you ask yourself, can, uh, is there like an enlightened being, enlightened monk, that we assume are enlightened, like in Thailand, there are various ajans that we believe are enlightened. And so, you know, is there a kind of permanent enlightened personality that, that one automatically becomes? You know, can a personality, anybody's personality, become enlightened? That, you know, can something artificial like a personality, sakyaditi or the ego, can that, can that attain enlightenment? Or is it just a, a mental habit? You know, it's a condition, it's a phenomenon. Because when we observe, when we reflect on our own views and opinions, you know, that which is aware of an opinion, aware of a name, aware of uh, uh, an object in consciousness, awareness is non-personal, it's anatta. So the Buddha made this anatta teaching very clear, and Theravada Buddhism is very strongly emphasized. The uh, anatta as this becomes a belief, becomes something we believe in because we've read it in the scriptures, and the Buddha, Buddha's words were about anatta. Or dhamma is not self. So we, we start investigating what, what do we mean by the ego, just the English word that's commonly used in psychology, the ego. What is, what is one's ego? We say egotistical, meaning someone's very kind of self-obsessed or self-important. But the ego is much, covers much more ground than, than just that kind of perception. The ego is a create an artificial creation that we acquire through our lives. In early life, you know, when a newborn baby doesn't have an ego. It's conscious. It has human form. It can be male or female. But if you ask a newborn baby if it's male or female, it doesn't answer, it doesn't know, it doesn't know what you're talking about. So awareness, mindfulness, Intuitive awareness, conscious awareness, these are all words that we use pointing at the reality of here and now before it becomes, before we grasp anything, before we become a person, a personality. And so, you know, in, in, uh, when we talk about awareness, being aware of awareness, in Thai, uh, Lung Pu Dung, one of the enlightened Thai masters who died many years ago, his definition of the third noble truth, Jit Hen Jit, and Jit is uh, consciousness, knows itself. It, it, just, it doesn't know itself as an object because it is itself. And that's the path to when you have that insight, when you realize through investigation, 
for yourself. You're not just believing me or Ajahn Amar or anybody else blindly, but all we can do is encourage and keep pointing in the, in the uh, you know, making you look, encouraging you to look at yourself. So if there's no personality operating in the present moment, there's silence. Is that jit hen jit? Is that consciousness knowing itself? You know, these are questions, and there's no answers. So any person, personality, never gets enlightened. So as long as you identify, I mean, it's impossible for a sankara to become enlightened because they're empty phenomena. When you explore, like in the Anatta Lakana Sutta, go through that whole sutta about Anatta, you know, there's nothing left. There's no self. So it sounds like annihilation, like we're just destroying the world, the conditioned realm. We, we get, kind of think it's something we've got to get rid of and destroy. But in the Dhammajaka Pavatana Sutta, the Buddha made it very clear it's neither Kama Sukali Kanu Yoko, kind of between eternal life as a person, eternity as a belief, as a, as a personality, that if we become enlightened, we will we'll live in Nibbana forever as, as some kind of soul, some kind of permanent undying personality. I'll always be Ajahn Samedo, even when I'm dead. You know, so whether, you know, we think of time, eternity in terms of time as something, a condition that lasts forever. You know, so eternity becomes a word that, that we use for, you know, someone is immortal, eternal, they never die. That person is, a, is, a, is, imagination, is imagination. No person can be eternal. Just observe your own personality, how changeable it is. How it's so dependent upon whether the sun shines or it's cold and wet whether people love you or hate you. You know, your personality shifts, changes according to so many other conditions. But you're aware of that, that awareness of how fickle your personality can be, how dependent it is on being liked and praised and successful and wealthy and approved of. You know, to be, to have a positive sense of self, self-love, appreciation for yourself, a positive ego is, you know, much sought after in many circles these days. To love yourself as a person. But we're not expected to love our personalities a sense of ourself as a person, we take refuge not in some kind of imagined love for my personality, but in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, which are symbols like any others, they're words, but they're pointing not at any one single one as a enlightened person, So they're to be reflected upon. So
So nothing can be more direct than a teaching of wake up here and now, like Buddha, you know, that particular word, Sanskrit Pali word from India, ancient languages, means awake. Awake doesn't mean you're not sleeping. It means you, you're no longer attached. You've seen, the, you've seen for yourself the suffering, the causes of suffering. By being attached to yourself as a person, as being a person who's right, or a person who's good, or a person who's no good, or whatever, however you rate yourself as in terms of good and bad, right and wrong, whether you love your personality or you, you don't like it, it doesn't matter as long as you're aware that what is personal, this sense of I am this physical form, I am this, this individual, independent self being sitting here on this seat, as long as I'm attached to that, then there's always suffering. Because attachment, clinging, blindly grasping conditioned phenomena is the cause of suffering. You know, so awaken awareness. You see, you, you don't just stop grasping when you awaken, but you observe the suffering, how much we, one suffers when you're grasping, a sense of your separateness, of yourself as a personality, of your position in the Sangha, of your position in the society. So grasping sankharas out of ignorance, as long as one grasps sankharas, <clears throat> there's going to, the result is always going to be suffering, some kind of suffering. It can't be otherwise because sankharas are terribly disappointing, even at their best because they don't stay at the best. Sankara, very nature is impermanence to change. The law of karma, what is born dies, what begins ends. So there's no enlightened sankaras. So then the question is, are we, is that all we can be is just empty phenomena? All of us sitting here dedicated to this path, this way of living, the samana life, is it just a pointless empty phenomena that we're indulging in? Some kind of belief system, some kind of religious cult that we've aligned ourselves with? Because there's so much media available about religious cults and belief systems, stories that we assume are always right. Stories we've been told since we were very young children, like what is cultural conditioning? But a story about what your parents believe is for, say, someone like the American way of life. The stories that are part of a cultural identity, whether you're British, American, Thai, French, doesn't matter, you get, you, you get different stories, different emphasis. But the, all they are are stories, propaganda, So like, it's interesting at a time where people are, nationalist movements are uh, popping forth around the world, you know, where people believe that their nation is special. 
or that one nation it has to be preserved, a nationality, national identity has to be preserved. And this is all empty phenomena. You know, it has no essence, no quality to it other than it, it is, you know, we've been maybe believing in it, never questioning it, since we just take it on as innocent children, like innocent, when, you know, as long as you're innocent as a child, you just believe what you're told. So then there's different problems between nations, fighting each other, whether you're French or German. Mexican or American. One time I asked Ajahn Pasano whether, he, you know, because North America includes Mexico and Canada, so I, I asked him, do you consider yourself American? And he said, no. <laughs> because the word American can, it tends to be aligned only with the United States. But there's South America, North America, and it's just a word given to, to continents that, you know, hundreds of years ago no one knew about except the native cultures and, that lived there. Is this island that we're living on now called England? Who calls it England? But we do. We say this is England. Does the land that we walk on, that we do, walk Jongrom, do meditation practice on, that we take walks around, does it say it belongs to anybody? That it belongs only, to, you know, is it's an English land? Or is this idea of a separate England from Scotland, from Wales, is this just empty phenomena, proliferation, cultural conditioning? You know, it's projection. We project these concepts onto experience. Just like we project the sense of ourself. We create images by believing certain monks are enlightened and other monks are not enlightened. But what is enlightenment, you know, in the reality of it? Is it just an empty word that is meaningless? Or is it a directional sign? What is it pointing at? And then we have to look at ourselves. You know, if we're looking for arahants or perfectly enlightened masters through, uh, through external sources, we might believe in somebody's enlightened, or we might have all kinds of doubts. You know, is it, somebody tells you that some great master is enlightened, and we believe that. That's a belief. We take it on as a belief. But in the very reality of it, it's just words projected onto a, a form or the, the history or memory of an image. So we're looking at the way things are rather than how we've been told they are or assume they are or believe they are. Stories are artifices, you know, they're not reality. You don't awaken to another story you know, when you see the suffering, when you realize for yourself the suffering you create through attachment to sankharas, to conditions, to phenomena, you know, you can observe that. Mindfulness, awareness. So it's not something you create you know, you don't create yourself as a mindful person, personality. 
you might believe that you're mindful or believe you're not very mindful, but that's, those are just assumptions you make with words because you see yourself always with a limitation of your form, of your experience, of your memories. And that binds you to suffering, as long as you never question that, never awaken out of that dream, out of that story. So taking, re <clears throat> taking refuge in Dhamma is much more profound than just chanting it in Pali language. It's not just a puja, another empty form that is part of an empty tradition. Because what the Buddha is pointing at is not at forms not at beliefs. There's nothing to believe in, really, in, in Dhamma. You don't believe in it because you don't quite know what it is as a, as a phenomenon. Can you point it out? Can you define Dhamma when you take refuge in Dhamma? Is Buddha, you know, is that, you're taking refuge in some kind of magical story about the Buddha nature in the universe? You know, you can kind of imagine, you know, the Buddha energy and holds the universe together or ultimate reality is, is something or other you can define with, with, with various words that, Nobody understands, really. So it's uh, awaken, wake up, look, observe. You know, this is, this is a gift of our humanity, is that we can do this. It's possible for, you know, the Buddha of the traditional Buddhist, Gautama the Buddha of ancient India, was a living example of a human being who broke through the illusions of his personality, his cultural conditioning, his own language and belief systems of the time, not by rejecting them or criticizing them, but by seeing that anything that arises ceases. Anything that is born dies. So we have these words, like sankara, in, in, in this tradition we use that a lot. Condition, phenomena, So as long as we, as, as a person, are trying to become enlightened, we'll only fail at it. No matter how serious you are at trying to become an enlightened person, you only fail. So it's not about becoming enlightened, it's about being awake here and now. So when we talk about enlightenment, there is enlightenment. But enlightenment involves seeing the, of the awakened conscious awareness here and now. So it's not something remote or in the future. It's not about practicing hard so 10 years from now you're enlightened. That's still, you know, Sakya Ditti. So 
I emphasize the silence as a refuge behind the noise of our thinking mind, our emotional habits. Even when you're caught up with crazy emotions or beliefs or doubts, underlying that is silence. Because awareness doesn't have a language. There's wisdom. Wisdom doesn't have a language. Languages are all sankharas, but we can use symbols, we can use Buddha rupas, we can use traditions, and that's up to us, you know, that's the encouragement. It's, it's not about a, a cult that you have to believe, and, and if you disbelieve, you have, you know, you're a heretic or you have to leave. But the encouragement is, if you don't believe what I'm saying, at least you can be aware that it's like this. Not believing is a sankhara, is it can be an emotion, a feeling, that you can observe. There's awareness of it. And this awareness isn't judging it. It's not about what you should believe or shouldn't believe anymore, but it, believing is like this and d disbelieving is like this. And when you patiently go through the fetters that bind you to sankharas, as you trust more in your awareness as your refuge, more and more you, you have a wise understanding, insight, insight into Dhamma. Dhamma is reality here and now. It's not some abstract idea, some metaphysical concept. So what is enlightenment? You can't, you know, try to imagine it as some kind of perfect state of bliss is one belief that enlightened individual is living in a blissful state forevermore. You know, so that's, it's perfection. It's the ultimate, it's being totally free from suffering. But as long as we bind ourselves to sankharas, we're going to suffer. Sometimes we can attain blissful states in this life, you know, where you have really what we call good meditation or good samadhi, where you get really blissed out. And, uh, and then, you know, if we're, if we're not reflective, we tend to attach to memories of previous good experiences in meditation and want them again. 
And that's desire, isn't it? Bhavadana, wanting something you don't have at this present time. So awareness here and now means that we, whatever we experience, whether we're absolutely miserable or doubtful or angry or jealous or frightened, blissed out or whatever, the real refuge is the silence that underlies all those states that arise and cease. And this has to, this is budget tongue, this has to be realized individually by each one of us. Because words, anything I say, is still sankaras proliferating on and on. I remember reading a quote in the Visuddhi Mug years ago, I forget exactly where, or even whether it was a soup, Visuddhi Magha, but it was a quote saying, there's a path, but nobody's on the path. And I thought, that's depressing, you know. Here I, <laughs> you know, I joined the Sangha to get on the path, and nobody's on it, according to this quote. But then as you investigate, as you begin to realize Dhamma for yourself, you realize that, that somebody, a person, can't get on the path. So as long as we believe we are the person we believe we are, we never question it. Am I Ajahn Sumedho all the time? You know, so I even ask myself this question. When is there no Ajahn Sumedho? And so, you know, I assume, you know, with a name, a title and so forth, that I'm permanently Ajahn Sumedho 24-7. That, uh, you know, I'm always, you know, the senior monk or whatever, you know, my position in the song I'm very identified with as a person. And is this personality of mine, is, it, is there a permanent quality to it that is with me all the time? And so by investigating, by examining suffering and its causes, I began to see that, you know, Ajahn Sumedho is, is a sankara, it was a title given to me by someone else. And that, it, you know, the sense of being Ajahn Sumedho arises when somebody says Ajahn Sumedho or I start thinking I'm Ajahn Sumedho. But other than that, there's no Ajahn Sumedho. There's awareness, consciousness, So investigating the sense of yourself, your personality, is not to say you should love yourself as a person or hate yourself or you should get rid of your personality. It's to understand personality is a sankara. It's a given factor. It's an artificial condition. It's empty phenomena. It's not to be despised, but it's not to be loved either or grasped. It is what it is. So I offer this as a reflection for this afternoon.